We're back to the Neil Haley Show and also the Caregiver Dave and the Celebrity Segment. I'm excited to welcome from Caregiver Dave and Sandy. Dave, how are you? And, uh, you know, awesome. you've, been, you've been busy, 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 as always. You're the busiest person, always somewhere new, something new happening with Caregiver Dave, and that's what's so fun about him. But our guest today is Kelly Holland. She is the author of You Are Worthy. Kelly, thanks for stopping by. How are you? Thanks so much, Neil. It's my pleasure. So did you ever think you'd become a published author? We talked about the grind of becoming one. Everyone's dream to become a published author. And it's a challenge. And you, you were able to meet that challenge. Well, it's true. Well, I should say that there's a bit of history there that my father published 15 books in his lifetime. He was an English professor. So I always sort of knew that this was a thing that people <clears throat> did. But that also gave me this added sort of hurdle to clear of would it be good enough? So uh, you know, this this went through six iterations or so before it became its final version. And uh, but it's out. I couldn't be happier. And it's you know, it's been a great ride. All right. So, Dave, I'll give you just a, get, you can go ahead with a question just about why she wrote the book and then we'll go from there. Yeah, well, I was going to ask, uh, does it does it seem like a lot of people today feel unworthy? You know, I think of that scene and <laughs> we're not worthy, you know, and. <laughs> It, I forgot the name of that movie. Uh, the two uh, time travelers. Bill and Ted. It was Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Bill and Ted. Thank yeah. you. Bill and Ted. Yeah. Yes. just doesn't work the way it used to. I can't figure that out. Yeah. I think. I think particularly among women, there's often a sense that um, they feel less than capable with money, even if they, they may know more than they think they do. But they feel less than capable, and they feel less educated in when it comes to taking care of their money. So the idea behind you are worthy is to both dispel that notion that and and convince them that they are in fact worthy they they do have the potential to take care of their money and make their money serve them and that learning how is not all that hard. And that's and so that, true. Yeah, that's true. How. Yeah, absolutely. That's so true because again, money is just a dirty word for everyone and it, it breaks up relationships. It does certain things, even though we're driven by money. The only things we are, we're, we're after in life is look good, have money and feel happy. And yet when it comes to saving, it doesn't feel good. When it comes to planning for money, it doesn't feel good. How do we kind of change that mindset uh, so that the future generations see how important it is to save money mm -hmm. and prepare themselves for the future, especially with, you know, taxes are going to increase and the inflation of this world and all that. So uh, you're absolutely right that we have a lot of feelings associated with money. I did wind up surveying 100 women as part of the research for my book. And when I asked them how they felt about money and what how what role money played in their lives, I heard stressed, anxiety and love hate as the most common responses. So you're absolutely right that money conjures up a lot of strong feelings. But one way, and you're also right that if we are thinking about ourselves as only in the here and now, that saving and planning for the future and holding back today feels less than pleasant. The key is thinking about the idea that there's a future you out there as well. And that person needs tending just as you do today. And so when you save today, you're taking care of you tomorrow. I actually had a client say that to me. Her name was, mm. well, her name's disguised, but let's just say the Deborah today takes care of the Deborah tomorrow. And that's how she talked herself into saving. It's a, it's a worthwhile saying. Yeah, a lot of people bring in a lot of bad attitudes about money, you know, like you're not supposed to love it. But actually a very wise man once said, it's the love of money <laughs> that's the root of all evil, not money itself. Well, I think my personal view is that money is at the end of the day, a tool like a bicycle or a screwdriver. It is a tool to help you live life the way you want. What's complicated about money is that, well, maybe this is true of a screwdriver, but it's certainly not true of a bicycle. A bicycle comes with a user's manual, money, not so much. And so it's really luck of the draw as to whether we learn these things. And if we don't, and we feel that we haven't learned them because we're somehow not smart or not deserving, then that can start the emotional baggage piling up. If we believe in our own worth in this space, then we can build the skills and we, we can see that we deserve to build the skills and then we can use money to serve us. Because really at the end of the day, money, it's, I wouldn't say it's at the root of all evil. It is at the root of a lot of uh, um, uh, evil events, I would say wars and 
you know, conquests, but, um, but money at the end of the day, it's really just a tool. It's just a tool to help us live our lives. Yeah. And in all fairness, uh, men struggle with that as well. I mean, you know, just because there's some very highly educated men who can figure out the stock market and figure out how to multiply their money. I mean, not all of us are in that category. It's absolutely true that men struggle with this as well. I focus on women because it's a particular passion of mine to empower women, but it's absolutely true that not every woman feels bad about money or that every man feels good. There are certainly men who struggle in this space and feel less than capable as well. But the same things apply. If you can build that sense of self-worth and the fact, the idea that you deserve to be using this tool and that you're more than capable of using this tool, then you have the mindset that helps you learn how. Yeah. And so the, the thought process is if you can teach people how to do a lot of the stressors of relationships, relationships with family, relationships with a marriage, relationships with just making sure you don't earn a lot earn living paycheck to paycheck and having enough for retirement is such a, such an important thing. And in your book, you really kind of try to delve into this. Is there an ultimate goal that you want from this book? What is the, what is the driver that you want people to learn by reading it? I want people to come away feeling that, and that's why I've structured it the way I did. The book has three parts. The first part is believe, the next part is learn, and the final part is build. So it's first believing in yourself, then learning the skills, and then building the plan. So I want people to come away feeling deserving, capable, knowledgeable, and focused. And then ultimately, that will help them feel hopeful and looking forward to the future. Yeah, there are a lot of myths about money that people need to get rid of, too, the way they were brought up. You know, I think of the author Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He talks about his his real dad, you know, was broke because he believed in, you know, a paycheck. And his rich dad believed that, he you know, you need to have assets that produce income. And so uh, do you find that a lot of people are just self-sabotaging themselves just because of the way they were raised and the uh, false notions about money that they have? I'm going to tell you sh something shocking that I learned in my research. I mentioned that I surveyed 100 plus women about their feelings about money and the effect of money on their lives. Of the 109 women I spoke to, 103 told me their beliefs about money were formed in childhood. And they're still walking around with those beliefs. So think about what that means. When we're kids, we're trying to understand this abstract thing. We don't really know what it is. So the only way we can get a clue to what it is is from the effect it has on the people around us. If and if our parents fight about money or act irresponsibly or struggle all the time, that's the message we get is that's what money does to you. And we carry that belief around in adulthood, even though we could be super capable of taking oh, really? charge of it. Wow. And, and that is the number one cause of divorce as well. It's a key cause of divorce. And you'd be shocked how many couples don't talk about finances before they get married. They try to do it. And yet it's still not the truth belief system. I think that there has to be some real horror stories told of why marriages fail and look at money as a, as a big driver because one person's the budgeter and the other person's the spender and that they don't want to hear from the budgeter and they see that or the one that once more and the other person, you really have to be a futurist before yeah. getting married, especially if you're talking about money. Because if you're not a futurist and see where everyone's going to go, it's going to be a complete uh, mistake. Now, you know, Kelly- It be uh, the discussion on your second date, by not, the way. Not exactly. I think this it needs to be, yeah, it needs to be discussion if it, right you know, the first bat before even getting on a date. Uh, you know, Kelly, potatoes yeah. and I'm a saver, right? Yeah, exactly. And what is, what, you, what is your thought process? Are you planning for the future? Are you going looking after retirement? Are you doing certain things? How big is your 401k uh, after? So here's the tip, because again, people need to pick up your book. But Kelly, you again, because of the success you've had in your brand, meaning getting to be on big, big shows and being a published author, well, who do you, you know, being in this industry, what advice would you offer people to get to this point? Because there's so many people who love to be in your place right now, Kelly, a published author, been, on, been recognized on some big platforms and big stages, how they too can do it. Because a lot of people who listen and watch my show have those aspirations to be that place. Mm -hmm. It's so lovely that you asked that um, because it's so great to share everybody's ideas around that. Uh, I would say the number one thing is you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you have unique gifts and talents that the world needs to have. 
and that you can provide a gift to the world. And if you think about it in those terms and can help you get past the insecurities and the bumps in the road that you will inevitably bump up against. Be flexible, expect there to be changes, expect there to be the unexpected, um, expect that you may change course over time, but uh, trust yourself. As Dr. Spock said long, long ago, you know more than you think you do. And I'm sure you didn't, you weren't just an overnight success. You put a lot of work in to get to where you are today. I was what you call a 30 year overnight success. How's that? Uh, okay. <laughs> that worked really hard for 30 years. Uh, well, congrats. So, and that's to the talk thing. to you, Neil. <laughs> yeah, it's 13 years doing this, 13 years doing this as of December 6th, over 9,000 plus shows, doing about 15 a week, and help grow my agency now. I really look at it's not, and, and I still want to grow and I still want to become better. And the thing is, you got to be driven in that way to be successful and put lots of hard work because people aren't seeing us, you know, Kelly, back when we started first year or second yeah. year and what we were dealing with and what we're doing. And what we're doing today is not what we're going to be doing tomorrow with the future of okay. everything, for sure. Dave, last, uh, Dave is a caregiver and he has a question about caregiving. Go ahead, Dave. Perfect. Yeah. So 25 years ago, my wife had a stroke. She lost her speech, became paralyzed on one side. And during a two and a half year grieving period, which was a living hell, we almost broke up, but we hung in there. And for some reason, I found a support group to go to. I learned to put on my oxygen mask first. And she slowly started responding, uh, becoming her old self again. Our love was rekindled. And now we reinvented ourselves. I'm Dave, the caregiver's caregiver. I help caregivers stay alive. 30% of them die before their loved ones do. I've written a book about it. It's Your Life to Thrive and Stay Alive as a Caregiver. And another book, uh, Secrets from the Hammock, Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times. And so now I'm putting on caregiver wellness retreats in Acapulco at a villa that I have access to. And it's a, it's a combination coaching program. And it also helps caregivers to get away from their loved one and relax and get some mastermind, get some support. My question to you, Kelly, is uh, how, how has caregiving touched your life? Whew. Well, I would say the biggest way is raising three children who turned <laughs> into, uh, well, one's still in college, but the other two are fully self-sufficient adults. And the, It doesn't with, stop when they're in college, by the way, as you know. <laughs> that, that is so true. Uh, I was, I would say the primary point person when both my parents fell ill and declined and ultimately passed away. So that, that's where caregiving's come in. I would say, circling back to our original topic, money can support something as, I'll call it sacred, as caregiving. It's really, it can, it can make these things possible. And when you take care of this particular resource, it can enable you to be the best caregiver you can be. I love the idea of your retreat. And uh, congratulations on coming full Thank circle. You. Thank you. If you know anybody who needs that, send them my way. And uh, Dave, I, I think that th this is going to be a big thing that you're developing and helping people for sure. Yeah. Caregiverdave.com. Caregiverdave.com. But everyone knows they search Caregiver Dave. You're going to find you. Kelly, best place to purchase your book. Where can we go? You can find my book everywhere books are sold. Awesome. And I will have the link in all the descriptions. Make sure everyone goes out and checks out this book. And I recommend, and again, it's for just women, but if you're a, uh, you know, the, the nerd and you want your significant other to not stop spending and become better in financials, buy Kelly's book. I appreciate it, Kelly. Your daughter to become financial. Daughter, daughter is even better. Yes, that's something you need to send out. All <laughs> great holiday gifts. Appreciate it, Kelly. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Thanks for stopping by. You're listening and watching the Neil Haley Show. We'll be back in just a moment.